So today we have the pleasure of welcoming Unbounded Capital's newest advisor, Mike Siegel. Welcome to the uh, the webinar, Mike. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Zach. Uh, pre appreciate the opportunity to be here. So I'd love to just start uh, with just understanding your background, or I really for our our listeners to understand your background, and if you can just share anything you you care to share about yourself that you think we'd want to hear. However, you'd like to take this, Mike. I'll leave it up to you. Uh, well, let's see. I think the most important thing to know about me is I gerrymander work to support my travel habit. Um, I realized that was my career uh, a few years ago now. Uh, no, so I, uh, I'm an LA native, uh, have been in the San Francisco Bay Area on and off since 1985 when I went to Berkeley. Uh, the off years included three years in Europe during the internet bust. Um, at Berkeley, I was originally in computer science. Dad was an early AI engineer and then switched to economics because I wasn't smart enough on the, for the technical side. I've co-founded um, uh, seven startups, eight if you count a not-for-profit not that we might touch on later. Um, uh, in 2012, well, I think I bought my, for this group, I bought my first Bitcoin in 2011, no, 2010. In 2012, I started working with SWIFT, the global payment organization, trying to help them create a bridge between their member banks and startups. And that sort of dragged me into the wild world of, of FinTech where I was working on what would have been my eighth commercial startup and ended up not moving forward with that, but becoming a partner at 500 startups in their FinTech fund, did 88 investments in 28 months in 26 countries in that one blockchain and one crypto investment. Um, did during that time also a lot of work with banks and insurers to try and create connectivity between startups and those institutions. And in 2019, after we had pretty much fully deployed the fund, I realized I didn't really like being a VC, um, not because I didn't like working with startups, which I adore, or with uh, other VCs, which I also really like, but rather the administration just kills me. And so today, I spend my time, about half of it, um, working with founders as a coach and advisor, and the other half working with emerging fund managers like Unbounded, um, again, as an advisor, an investment committee member, a venture partner as a service. Yeah. Well, I think I and almost every other VC fund manager can relate to not really enjoying the administrative aspects of running a fund. Uh, and like a lot of folks, even today that are running blockchain focused VC firms, anyone that tried to start a fund doing anything in crypto or blockchain pre 2020 was advised by their lawyers to, instead of having venture funds to have these hybrid venture hedge funds. So, you know, honestly, the administration of a venture fund after you go through the running a hedge fund, especially a crypto hedge fund, it, <laughs> it's still annoying, but it's a lot easier. Fair, fair point. Uh, but yeah, I'm glad I got those, those reps in, even if I didn't necessarily enjoy it. Um, so I, I'd, I'd love to double click on what you said at the beginning, which is, you know, your your work is really something to support your travel habits. How did you realize that that was the case? And, you know, what what is it about travel that really, really excites you? Um, so I, I sort of ran away from the internet bust um, by uh, pursuing um a relationship with a woman that I met in the Czech Republic when when the internet bust happened, I flew uh, first to Prague and then uh, with her to London because her job moved there. And uh, I realized the relationship wasn't going anywhere, but I sort of managed to sh show up, if you will, um, and try and be of service to the local entrepreneurial ecosystem in London at the time, which was still somewhat nascent compared to what it is now. But you know, in exchange for just sharing what I know, folks would share you know, their culture with me, their restaurants with me, their experiences with me. And I just found that, that you know, opportunity to learn other cultures um, intoxicating. I mean, my favorite story like this, I uh, 
flew for Swift, it was going to a conference in Mauritius. And so after a 28 hour transit, I landed and this buddy and I went to the local um, startup hub, which was a French tech hub, I guess. And we coached uh, 20 local entrepreneurs and three of the entrepreneurs were sisters. And they said, oh, we really appreciate this. We want you to come to our home for dinner later this week. Um, we went to their, their home, which it turns out three nights a week, their parents converted their living room into this tiny little Indian restaurant. And so they made us dinner and we got to meet the family and meet their, you know, their local, um, uh, everyone else in the community, how, learn how these women's ambition really had lifted up the whole community because it turned out they were doing something very interesting in that. And then the day after uh, we got this delivery of giant you know, pastries that they had all, they had cooked for us back at the hotel, which I then got to share with you know, everyone at the Swift conference. And that was, it was just so much fun. It was just so cool. So you've now landed in, in Lisbon uh, where you've been for, I guess, is it close to two years now? Uh, 13 months next okay. weekend. Closer to a year. Presumably yeah. you intend to stay there for, for a bit. Do you think, do you, what do you see moving forward? Are you going to have this be like a, a hub and then constantly going to other ecosystems or do you see yourself constantly kind of moving your home bases uh, for the um, most year? Well, having, having just gotten an apartment and a dog, um, I think I'll probably keep Lisbon as a home base, but yeah. you know, what's, what's great about it, aside from just, you know, the quality of life here is amazing is it's so close to everywhere, you know, across Europe, Middle East and Africa, uh, blood, you know, and New York. Um, and so I've really taken advantage of that. Uh, you know, I've been to, to Spain, to Gibraltar, to Saudi Arabia, to Dubai. I was just in Iceland a week ago or two weeks ago. Um, so, you know, again, it's, it's kind of like the, I get to show up here after 35 years in the Valley and say, I'd like to help. What can you introduce me to in, in exchange for that? And, and that seems to be working out really well. Yeah, I definitely look forward to joining over there, which will be not so many months. Not uh, so many months. Yeah, it, I'm looking it forward is very to uniquely positioned of those cities you mentioned. It's like seven hours to Dubai, a little under six to New York, five-ish to Iceland. Definitely, you know, if, if you're a traveler where maybe, you know, five, six hours is your cutoff, in terms of like needing to like sleep or you know need a much nicer seat to be able to work you have many 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 options that are kind of it, below that which is nice exactly and you know the relationships i have in the us aren't going anywhere as a result of me being here so yeah it's pretty pretty good so you you write on your linkedin and this is something i, I just discovered in kind of prep for this interview that you're a, and I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation, you're a consigliere to founders and fund managers. What does that word mean? A consigliere. <laughs> um, why did you, and why yeah, did you choose that word? Um, I chose it because I just love the, uh, the Robert Duvall's character in The Godfather, where he serves yeah. as the, the consigliere. Um, so for me, it just had some emotional resonance. I'm, I'm finding that a lot of folks uh, younger than me, surprisingly, surprising number, have never seen The Godfather. And that's just, you know, a travesty. I hate that. But, um, what, you know, I, the, the role that I serve is really to help folks from making the mistakes that I've made and hopefully, you know, help them accelerate the business that they're building, whether it's a, an actual startup or a fund, as a result of not making those mistakes, perhaps some of my connections help. And, you know, having been through quite a few market cycles and challenging situations, often you'll find that, you know, you go into a company that's having a hard time and you're the wartime, can, you know, can, uh, consul Gary, you, like you get, okay, guys, you got to learn how to go to the mattresses. And that actually means cutting half of your staff. Let's get it done. Here's how you do it in the right way. Like it, it, it's those kinds of situations. So being aligned with the founders, whether it's a founder of a company or the founders of a fund, 
um, and helping them build the business, it, it sort of feels like the right thing. Uh, I've now, by the way, found like when talking to fund managers, um, especially since a lot of emerging managers haven't for some reason seen Godfather, it's like, okay, I'm a venture partner as a service. They're like, oh good, I need one of those. <laughs> I can assure you that all Unbounded Capital team members uh, have seen The Godfather. So Thank can, God. Yeah. Do, and uh, I never asked this question. <laughs> does, does, does Unbounded make all of its founders watch things like Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, so they understand what sales is? Um, you know, there's nothing that we require, but we do actually, I actually need to share this with you. We do have a document of kind of more so books than, you know, movies or TV to kind of understand okay. you know the advent of the firm and uh Nassim Taleb is the most overrepresented author there if that gives you a idea but yeah lots of things about just got it risk and risk and reward um oh yeah <laughs> uh maybe when we're all in New York we'll see the theatrical performance um, there you go Dave writes Dave was actually a uh, a film major and worked in the film industry for a number of years before Unbounded so oh amazing I didn't realize yeah. that um What's an example of kind of one of these slam dunk situations where you go into a fund, you go in, go into a company, and you're been able to very quickly, you know, change the trajectory for the better, add value uh, for those listening to just understand like what is it, what would bringing on Mike Siegel, uh, you know, look like in a in a best case scenario? Well, I, you know, I don't know whether it was was me, but the easy example for me to point to is the fact that you know more than two thirds of our portfolio at 500 um, went on to raise additional rounds of capital. So in 88 companies, that's not a bad track record going from you know, pre-seed to, to seed. Um, an another company, one that I've been working with quite a long time, they started out building an AI tool to try and match startups and founders and I, you know, or startups and, and investors. Um, and this is going back six or seven years, I think. And, you know, we sat down and, and my bias having run an analyst firm that was in that business was there's really not enough um, revenue, despite the number of startups, there's not enough revenue in being the data provider for a startup investment, right? Because the, the tickets just aren't big enough. Um, it's not like a, you know, GLG supplying data to hedge fund managers. It's not that kind of situation. And so we talked through um, the pivots that they could do, you know, what, what aligned with the reason they were in the business, the, the technology they had built, and they ultimately pivoted in being a small business lender for under collateralized small businesses, which in, in emerging markets, which have the same kind of lack of data transparency or lack of data pure you know purely um issues and you know now the company's gone on and they're they're killing it so that saved them a lot of pain and suffering saved their existing investors a lot of pain and suffering um because they just made a, a great pivot awesome yeah well i can't can't argue with with those two stories right there um, it's funny the the second, you know, company you mentioned there, uh, is somewhat similar to one of our first investments we made at Unbounded, uh, which is all about, you know, bringing more data and better underwriting from that data to small business owners and emerging markets that don't have collateral. So that's definitely still, despite the success of that company and the success of ping me that we've invested in a major, major problem where incredible businesses that have never, you know, missed a payment before. We don't happen to have tons of collateral sold, you know, the best rate that you can get for in a lot of the world is like 30%. And that's just, oh, yeah. you know, really, and that's, yeah, that just means there's so well, many less business. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, that's a, that's a giant, you know, economic, economy level infrastructure problem for yeah. the country, for, for the world. Right. It's so, you know, as startups, we can make small changes in that, but when we actually build the industrial infrastructure, to support any small business getting access capital they want, then, you know, those three sisters in Mauritius, like they wouldn't need me. <laughs> okay, so shifting gears to the area of our focus at Unbounded, Mike, uh, you know, you have now decided to advise a blockchain focused firm 
uh, yeah, prior to this, you, know, you haven't had a ton of exposure to blockchain. I know you've had some, you, you know, first bought Bitcoin in 2010, but relatively speaking, it hasn't been, you know, your, your focus. Um, why make the shift now to directly advise a blockchain, you know, focus firm? And what are you most bullish on in the near and long term in regards to blockchain technology? Okay, not, a, not much in that question. Um, so I am not advising a blockchain firm. I'm advising a firm with a really talented group of emerging managers that have found an interesting thesis, which happens to go along with the, you know, the change I see in the world around where blockchain becomes a critical infrastructure to build businesses on, as opposed to, you know, a, a technological excuse for, you know, the kind of shenanigans that have gone on over the last several years. Um, so it's more about, you know, your team's talent and that you have a, an interesting thesis that I think I can contribute to um, more than it's blockchain, right? Um, now, what I think is interesting about blockchain now is, you know, with all the difficulties we've had, the regulation, the crash, the, the fraud and everything else, I think it's acted as a bit of a disinfectant for the industry. And so, and we've had a whole lot of dumb money pouring in since, you know, 2012, I guess, right? When you look at the, the amount of venture capital chasing blockchain um, since, since, that, since around that time, a whole lot of money is poured in, not a lot has come out other than we learned what doesn't work. Um, so I think we, you know, we've sort of gone through that Gartner hype cycle trough of disillusionment piece. And now there's a lot, a big opportunity to build the right kind of businesses that this architecture enables. Um, for me as a FinTech geek, you know, I think the, the most interesting area is the idea that we're going to be able to um, digitalize assets, right? So if we look at, you know, broadly speaking, if you, if you look at financial services, you're talking about, I don't know, like 11 trillion in market cap right now. But if you think about financial assets, you're talking about 90 trillion or something in that, in that you know, realm. And so the idea that we can bring efficiency automation um, to digitalizing assets, that's super interesting to me. Probably to everyone here on this call as well. <laughs> Right. And um, yeah. I, I want to make the, disti the distinction between sort of crypto is a digital asset versus things like, I don't know, fractionalizing corporate bonds and yeah. making those manageable programmatically as opposed to with, you know, paper and, and phone calls and faxes and whatever it is, you know, that's going into it right now. So that's interesting. Yeah, not speculating on the potential future value of a digital asset that currently is unproven to have value, but you know, making existing assets that are proven to have value with deep liquid markets have you know more efficiency and liquidity, uh, for sure. Um, as as you know, Mike, we have kind of our one investment with Tokenize that is directly solving you know working on solving that problem today. Um, but I think it's been very disappointing as many investors have identified exactly what you've you know spoken to as kind of the promising. The promise of crypto, the promise of blockchain, and and really in terms of like actual real world usage and adoption to date, it's been close to zero of any of that happening, despite this technology being around and from our point of view being capable of it. So I I hope what you're excited about, what we're excited about here, actually starts to you know come to come to fruition sooner than later. Well, you uh, look at something like tokenize, and and you're talking about having you know gotten to where they are in opposition to amazing headwinds yeah right the we don't know what this is and how do you regulate it and you know how do my banks understand it and 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 all the rest right and the fact that there's just not enough liquidity out there to buy those assets that you know if it's a tech founder they talk more about blockchain than they do about well actually this asset kind of you know 
we, we can charge, you know, a tenth of the number of basis points for managing this asset that someone else would, and we can still make a lot of money doing it. Um, yeah. And with everything that's happened, hopefully in the near term, a company like that will have amazing tailwinds. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we and hope folks so. like, you know, BlackRock and everyone launching their, their Bitcoin ETFs is only going to, well, do our marketing for us. Yeah. Uh, speaking of some of the major financial players, uh, you know, and, and payments, uh, since uh, we set this up, something really big called Fedwire came out. Uh, having worked in <laughs> you know, payments and fintech uh, for, for decades now, who do you think some of the biggest beneficiaries are? And, you know, what opportunities does this technology create for payment companies leveraging blockchain? Um, so the, the nonprofit, not-for-profit that I set up and ran was something called 2022 Labs. And what that looked at was trying to promote the usage of a payment messaging standard called ISO 2022. Um, and uh, amongst other folks, I, I got to know the folks at the Fed that were working on that project because underlying Fedwire is the ISO 2022 format. And there are, by the way, a couple of tokens that use the format as well. I think Cardano, for example, uses the format. Um, and what that is, is a standardized way to represent rich data around a payment. So when you look at something like Fedwire, and they're certainly not the first one, and in fact, they're, they're, they're pretty far along as, as these kinds of infrastructures go, what it's really done is it's brought um, into light that there really isn't a whole lot of value add in efficient clearing and settlement now, right? So the way that I look at it is pressure to completely commoditize the price of moving a payment around. And I think what you're going to see is it's an accelerator on, you know, cards, ACH, cross-border, et cetera. They're all ultimately going to do the same thing unless you add layers on top of it. Right. Yeah. So um, I think that that the real beneficiaries are anyone in the payment space that figure that out faster and do something about it. Right. It's not about moving the payment from A to B. It's about how easy it is to initiate the payment, recognize the and reconcile the payment at the other end and get that working with the rest of the systems that, that the payments, you know, have to interact with. Um, and so, you know, will Fedwire take off? Potentially, I mean, you know, it has the Fed behind it. There's only, you know, 40 banks or so on it now and they only have 4,000 to go, um, let alone all the, all the credit unions, but they're gonna push it. And that means that, Anything that can move money quickly um, and cheaply will have an opportunity that they don't have now. I do think that a lot of financial institutions that would adopt using Fedwire, you know, it's costly to do that integration. And so I think when they look at amortizing the cost of doing that in integration, they're going to think hard about, well, what, you know, if it's going to change our business model, which in many cases it will how really are we going to have our next business model? What can we do with it? Well, thank you for that. It's definitely been, uh, I, th I think, pretty exciting, at least in my world, just kind of hearing all the different takes on on Fedwire. Um, I think I've, I've heard everything from, oh, this is just another one of what's already been done before to this is going to phase out ACH and wire within the next year uh, and everything in between. But I think most people do agree that it definitely does create a lot more opportunities for you know, all sorts of payment companies that can do what Fedwire does and then some, uh, yeah. which is certainly great for a you know, subset of blockchain companies working on payments. There was one company we looked at quite some time ago. This was in the context of the, the not-for-profit that um, they would create 
a token, not as you and I think about a token, but rather just an authentication token um, that you could insert in um, the extended messaging fields of a payment. And what that would do, that token would do is it would refer to somewhere on their proprietary blockchain that stored all of that excess data that the current mess payment messaging systems could not contain. So you'd basically have the invoice that the payment referred to stored on their blockchain, a pointer from the payment message to that invoice. So when the payment got to the other end, they could put it back together on an automated yeah. basis and do the auto reconciling. That may that kind of structure may be an opportunity where blockchain's not moving the payment, but it is all the value add. Yeah, for sure. I think that general concept of hashing data and you know that being what is the future of authenticating data, whether that data is payments or or something else, I think is really important, not just with Fedwire, but also with AI. So we're at the point now where you know, there are deep fakes that can fool everyone here on this call without using sophisticated software, maybe even when using sophisticated software. Um, so the only only way we're gonna not live in a world in a number of years where we can't trust anything we see on the internet is having some way to authenticate each piece of that gr largely growing data set of, you know, content produced by, you know, some type of AI versus by humans. So. Yeah, I think all blockchain companies are are working in that problem. And frankly, for anyone listening, that's that's a problem we've been very excited about someone tackling for years at Unbounded, but we haven't seen a single company that has, you know, made sense to invest in that's doing that. So hopefully now with the kind of tailwinds of of AI, we start to see some more promising companies working on that. So Mike, I I, I wrote this quote down here because it's one of my favorite things that you have written. Um, this is in your, your deck, which I'm happy to share here in the, the chat if you'd like, but uh, early stage venture capital is momentum investing masquerading as fundamental investing. Can you share more what you mean about this? Um, so that, that quote, the deck that you're referring to, and I'm happy for you to go ahead and, and, yeah. and share the link to it, um, but that the deck is designed to help entrepreneurs understand the things that they don't usually understand about how VCs work. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure this is a very sophisticated audience in terms of what is momentum versus fundamental investing. But for many entrepreneurs, I have to unpack it. And I basically say, look, if you invested in Peloton or Zoom or Amazon in January of 2020, you were you know, probably doing it based on fundamental analysis of that company or someone's fundamental analysis. If instead you wrote that check, for example, on April 1st, 2020, you were momentum investing, right? There were tailwinds, thank you COVID, that were going to drive at least the market cap of those companies, if not the revenues of those companies. So, you know, it's really hard to build a startup successfully. Um, when you invest at the pre-seed stage, over 99% of those investments will fail to generate any return, right? And you can look at my portfolio at 500 and see some evidence of that. Um, so to, to win, you have to be both lucky and good. And the lucky piece, I tend to find that um, investors, VCs, will package as you know the story about the market. It's not just why is this a big market, but why is right now a great time to have a differentiated offer for this market? Why is it end of March 2020 and you're introducing, you know, a, a great, you know, what what was the one called Hop In, which was sort of a, a community overlay to to messaging and and web conferencing. And Hopin probably wouldn't have gotten much of anywhere for a very long time, but given it showed up, you know, they came to market um, just at that moment in time, they went like this. And so VCs tend to want to see companies that are capturing that lightning in a bottle from a trend perspective, not just because it'll increase the likelihood 
that the company is successful, not just because it'll reduce the amount of work that the VC has to do to help it, but also because the narrative ends up being very good for LPs. Yeah, we went into you know, LLM training models uh, a month or six months before OpenAI came to market. And as a result of that, our company has now done this. So VC is always going to benefit from momentum under fundamentals, over, over, fund, over fundamentals. It's not that fundamentals don't have to be there, but it's a whole lot easier to make money in VC when you have momentum. Do you think it's possible to make money at the earliest stage stages of venture investing, whether pre-seed or seed, by taking a different, you know, more fundamental-based approach? Um, I guess I would answer that two ways. Um, given, and this may be a little bit, you know, so I'm showing my my cynicism here, right? But these most VCs exist on management fees until they get both lucky and good, right? Um, I think momentum helps um, maintain the VC mystique. I think as an angel, you probably can make money at the very early stages pretty, pretty easily. If you have a reasonable size portfolio, you'll definitely be subject to power laws. And I think there are models out there that are not traditional venture capital for making money at the early stage. But I think as a VC, if you're not stacking the deck with momentum, you're probably not fully stacking the deck. Okay. Definitely a topic I look forward to exploring with uh, yourself and the Unmatted Capital, Unmatted Capital team in the future. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I'll leave it at that for now. Uh, what are I? I wouldn't. I wouldn't really say that that's a particularly. I think you you phrased it in a, in a in a very unique way that allows for others to pick up on this insight about VC. But that's not that's not so much a contrarian opinion within kind of broader venture capital. I think most VCs, to some degree, you know, if you know, questioned about that, would admit it, even if they wouldn't necessarily lead with the fact that they try to do lots of momentum investing as part of their approach. Are there any- Oh, that goes or, completely yeah. against the narrative that VCs have to tell LPs, right? But but how many VCs actually believe that, you know? Believe that they have to do momentum? Uh, or that they can win on fundamentals? That they can win on fundamentals alone? Uh, I would say none. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would say Probably none. Yeah. Okay. But again, again, what you what you look for at a given stage of a company is very different, right? So yeah. when when at, at our at our stage, we're looking for team and TAM. So the fundamental is what's the shift in the market? Yeah. Right. What's the shift in the market that makes this relevant now? Anyway, sorry. No, no, all good. So I just you know that. Do you have any opinions about venture capital that you would just say are distinctly contrarian or that? the vast majority of your peers disagree with? So there's a, 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 another fund that I work with that late stage investing in software companies. And it's a, a couple of entrepreneurs who have taken companies public before. They've not been money managers, although some of them have worked in, in banking in the past. And um, their belief is that late stage venture capital is broken. That in fact, you know, if your company at our right at Fund Bounded has a company that gets a bunch of money from Andreessen Horowitz, the fact of the matter is we may not make any money. There's a higher likelihood we won't make any money because they're going to push that company to wait to go public. And then their preference stack is going to absorb all of our profits. And so this fund, they say, look, we're going to invest at the Series B and we're going to help you get out on a non-NASDAQ, a non-US exchange in 18 to 24 months, that moving to evergreen capital earlier, going public earlier, and having that currency that is not controlled effectively by late stage VCs is much better for the entrepreneur and much better for the early stage investors. 
And so, you know, normally the average LP will look at a VC and say, so did Sequoia or Andreessen or Benchmark or whoever invest in your companies um, as a way of gauging whether, you know, you can attract the right kind of follow on capital. And I happen to agree with these guys, GPO fund that, yeah, if you can find another way, because I remember when I went through a going, uh, an IPO process, it was just post Sarbanes-Oxley. Um, and that was a very, very painful thing. And remembering when you didn't need, you know, multi-billion dollar funds to put in hundreds of millions of dollars to get your company to 5 billion or more to go public. Like, I think that was a much healthier environment. How often in your experience do you see early stage investors get kind of screwed over with pref stack from later stage investors? Um, I think it's about to happen a whole lot more frequently. <laughs> like I can remember yeah. just right, uh, just, just post um, 2008 and just post 2000 where it was happening quite a bit. We certainly at 500, we, we engineered our relationships with our entrepreneurs specifically to avoid it. Meaning, yeah. you know, we, we, we told them that every so often they would get an offer for a series A that would crush us out. And we hope we delivered enough value that they would turn down that term sheet. And but, what would those yeah. term sheets look like? So for people listening here, like, if you're investing at the pre-seed level, your company is generating revenue, maybe it's found product market fit, they're going out to market for a series A, what are some of the things that might maybe appear in the headline to be good, but actually like the terms that make that so so bad for kind of early stage investors in that company? Um, effectively, it's no, we're gonna take all of your early, um, early investors pro rata. We, we would like, you know, the entire round. And that just being, so, so you're saying that getting screwed is just not being able to invest more at the higher valuation. Because at, at, at early stage, right, doubling down is a really important function. There's diff different points of view on that, on that one, <laughs> I think. I think there's been a lot of successful <laughs> investors that take both approaches. Without a doubt, right? I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm coming from a world where it was large for, you know, the thesis that, we executed successfully was lots of little bets double down on the winners. Yeah. Are there any other, you know, tactics that the series A and beyond investors, you know, use uh, to screw up, screw out the early investors sometimes? Oh, we're going to, we're going to see more and more about, you know, preferences and drag along rights and, and, and all of that. I mean, you've already seen, it, and I know we, we, you know, we've considered, putting out um, term sheets that we would think entrepreneurs would walk away from just, you know, 12 months ago. So there's, you know, yeah. a whole raft of ways to make sure that I, as the Series A investor, right, am, uh, am um, uh, as insured against risk as I can possibly be. Yeah. Yeah, and when there's a lot less capital being deployed, you know, those, those are gonna get signed a lot more. Absolutely. Right. Uh, there, I've been in situations not in, in the not terribly distant past um, where, you know, we're we've been constructing pay to play rounds to squeeze out the investors who may have been very supported back in back in the day. But now they're yeah. not willing to put, you know, any more in to help bridge this company to where it's got to go. And so sorry, but you don't get to be on the cap table anymore. And, and just to, you know, for everyone listening to make sure they understand what we're talking about, what is a pay to play round? Um, I'm going to reset the valuation somewhere lower than it was. And for you to keep your rights, you're going to have to invest more in this round. So you're actually now investing against the valuation that you set previously. And if you don't, you get nothing. And if you don't, you get nothing. Yeah. And it's just a tactic to clear off the cap table. Yep. Probably be seeing more Good. of those. Yep. Um, so my last question before I, I open it up for the for the audience, uh, 
is what are some of the biggest misconceptions people have about power laws? Being at 500 startups and investing in you know, more individual startups than almost any other investor, if not maybe more than any investor over a given period. Uh, I know, you know some Dave and others at 500 I've spoken to have a lot of strong views on this. So I, I figure you probably <laughs> do as well. <laughs> um, look, I, I think I, I, I can't really answer that question effectively. I don't, you know, I don't know. And maybe it's because I've so integrated the lessons that I've learned that it's hard to tell the, you know, the differences between the two, um, you yeah. know, any given investment, and I guess this, it also, it's a little situational for markets, right? Because I've had reasonable arguments with folks in emerging markets where there's not a lot of capital and returns that don't look like venture returns are actually okay, right? Because they're, they're, the, the, the allocators don't really know what a venture return looks like. And so, you know, getting 5X on your money in two years looks like absolute magic in those markets, whereas anywhere, anywhere in, in, you know, on the West Coast or New York or London, that would be an abject failure. Um, uh, so you can make, I guess I would say you can make money without the power law, but you can't execute venture capital without it. Are there any VCs or maybe VCs is the wrong word with your view of the world, but are there any investors you respect that have tried to do that? Um, you know, and, and maybe have not succeeded, but just curious if there's any examples of people trying to execute venture capital, uh, a venture capital strategy without, you know, maybe capturing the power law in the traditional way. Um, not, not off the top of my head. I mean, I, I think ultimately, right. It ends up looking a little more like private equity than it does like venture capital, you're, yeah. you're, you know, you're going to have to do the work of, of mining, uh, mining your portfolio, facilitating M&As, roll-ups, or these kinds of things. So it's a, it's a heavier lift. And I, I generally think of that as, you know, individuals rather than firms, but it's not, um, it's not universal. Well, I have some more just, you know, Zach questions that I'd love to ask Mike on a personal level. But before I continue to indulge myself. Is there anyone on this uh, Zoom that would like to ask Mike a question? As a reminder, you can just type it in the chat or you can do the little hand raise thing on Zoom and I'll unmute you and you can ask Mike directly. Okay, I'll, I'll go with one now while people are, are thinking of what to ask. What do you like most and what do you feel like needs the most improvement on the kind of early stage venture ecosystem in Lisbon and Portugal? So I'm, 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 I'm not sure if I have a, you know, a perfect experience set yet, but, you know, and you and I, we've discussed this a little bit. The Portuguese tend to be amazing makers. They craft yeah. things, whether it's food or art or architecture or music or code, they're, they're craftsmen. They produce truly beautiful stuff, um, but they don't really market very well. They don't market themselves. They don't market what they make. Um, and so I think the way that I see that translating into, into the eco, the entrepreneurial ecosystem here is there's not a ton of, uh, of entrepreneurial ambition. There's not a lot of think big, conquer the world, right? That kind of thing. There, there are some and it's improving, but yeah. I still think it has a, a, they hit above their weight class on the product side and below their weight class on the go-to-market side, right? I think that the venture investors here, um, there's some who've been here for a couple of market cycles. There are some here who've only been for, a, for a, you know, one market cycle or no market yeah. cycles. I think they're, they're, they're progressing along a reasonable curve, but I think the, the entrepreneur side and in particular, the commercial side needs, you know, they, they need a, a, a step function. Are there any startups that are, you know, Portuguese founders in Portugal that you're particularly excited about? I haven't gotten to know nearly enough yet, um, yeah. right? I mean, the couple that I've met, um, 
there's good ideas again lack of ambition and yeah. it i don't want you know i don't want to blanket it but i have the, a sense of again they're 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 not thinking aggressively enough on go to market right there's many markets where you've got a small local market um and that prompts folks to think uh globally from day one um here you might see Iberia, you might see um, Brazil, but I don't feel like like you know world domination um, is is the average mentality of the entrepreneur here. How how big is the entrepreneurial community, and is there a particular like market or product theme that you've seen from the year you've been been there? Um, well, you can find. I mean, it, it, pure number don't know um, of. I think 11 billion has come into the market as a result of, of golden visa investments, but something like um, three quarters of that or more is actually into real estate funds, not into to what you and I think of as venture capital yeah. funds. So there's, there's, there's plenty of money, but not all of it is going in. Uh, yeah. Interestingly, there's, there's like five unicorns, which is not bad for a market of, you know, 10 and a half million people. Um, in terms of technology, I think a lot of Web3 entrepreneurs moved here um, because of what crypto taxation here was like before the uh, ECB came um, knocking, and a lot of them have still stayed. So there is a, I think there's a center of excellence for Web3. Um, yeah. I think there's a center of excellence around deep tech. Um, there's a lot of, of uh, ocean and sustainability related tech. Um, yeah. so, so that's a strong one. And in the North, there's a fair, uh, particularly in the North, um, there's a, a fair grouping of, of AI, you know, entrepreneurs. Cool. So I would say yeah. more, more, more deep tech than you would expect from a market of this size. Yeah. That's certainly exciting. Um, yeah. No, how, how do you how do you see, you know, the Portuguese entrepreneurial ecosystem growing over the next, you know, three to five years realistically? Um, I think that depends a lot on, um, you know, whether the trend of you know, candidly, American entrepreneurs moving here um, continues. Right, there's been a a pretty good trickle for many years that now has increased over the last year, year and a half. And the, the Portuguese tend to be very welcoming and yeah. to try to, you know, integrate people and lessons from abroad effectively. And I think as you get, and this is something I just like, you know, traveling the world, talking to entrepreneurs because of when you get you know, entrepreneurs from everywhere in a room together or investors, VCs, angels in a room together from everywhere, best practices get traded really on a very, you know, porous and efficient basis. So yeah. I think um, as long as you continue to get more folks that can push aspiration as an important part of being an entrepreneur in the market here, I think, um, this this ecosystem will hit above its weight class on an ongoing basis. And I think that can accelerate over the next couple of years, particularly right as venture money comes back into the market. Besides the famous web summit that happens like every November, I believe, are there other, you know, big events that you'd recommend that people listening to this consider, you know, planning a trip to to Lisbon or Portugal around? to get from well, the entrepreneurial ecosystem? They certainly do. Um, I think it's just after Web Summit. It's kind of a crypto month, right? Last year, yeah. Solana did their thing here and Near did their thing here and a, and a bunch of others. So there's, you know, the, not the scale of Web Summit, but awfully close um, for the Web3 and crypto community that's worth coming to. Um, you know, the, the summer is a little bit crazy, I happen to like, you know, the cultural festivals that go on. Got a friend who's got a, a winery in the South that's putting on a 
music festival for a few days in in October. Hopefully, you'll be here by then, and we can we can get you to come along. And uh, so those those are the the key things. There hasn't been a whole lot beyond those yet. I mean, I've I've seen you know. Uh, well, I spoke at a seminar in Madeira, one of the islands off the coast, yeah. on Web Web three in healthcare, and that was you know a hundred real hitters from the healthcare industry from around Europe, but they're not you know they're not large scale events like you have you know every two weeks in in London or or Paris yet. Yeah. Well, but it's kind of well, like yeah. what are you, what are you interested in? I can. I can probably point you at something. Yeah, definitely. Mike knows people. That's something I've learned <laughs> in a few months. We've gotten to know each other. Uh, it's been very to, helpful to, for to, my yeah. <laughs> to, well, I'd say to the unbounded uh, ecosystem. I'm, I, if I can be helpful in navigating this market, I'm happy to. Yeah. Well, with you know me, you know, moving there relatively soon. Uh, watch out for the you know what I'm sure will be uh, the the big unbounded capital uh you know unbounded perspectives series that we've now done in new york and austin coming to lisbon likely sometime next year um awesome yeah i i hope to be able to find uh a wonderful you know either portuguese um you know startup that is within our our thesis and ecosystem um and also you know we'll continue kind of singing the gospel uh hopefully especially more so after i move there of startups and founders from around the world, you know, moving to a place like Portugal to continue building uh, their companies. I, I hope so as well. I do think, I thought, saw the number the other day. I want to say there's like 15 or 18 Web3 accelerators here. That's that a seems, lot. That seems like a lot. So if anyone, you know, is coming over and wants to mentor at one of those accelerators, that's a possibility too. Well, anyway. Mike... On that note, we're we're nearing our time here. I'm going to give one last call for anyone here to to ask Mike a question. Um, and in the interim, Mike, is there anything besides just reemphasizing that if you're listening to this and you're looking for your own consigliere in in Lisbon, <laughs> Mike is available, and I'm happy to connect you. Anything else people people should know, or how best to you know learn about you? Um, yeah, where should we be sending people, Mike? Um, oh, uh, so recently I had to be at a conference and had to give them a brand. And so I set, actually some friends set this up for me and I'll put it in there. Seagullventures.com sort of is the outline of, of what I do. Um, okay. So no, if you're, if you're coming to, to Portugal, please reach out. And if I can be helpful to your funds, to your investment strategy, to your, you know, your portfolio companies, reach out to that about that too. And and thank you for welcoming me into the uh, unbounded community. I'm 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 really psyched. I I look forward to to a long long fruitful relationship. Well, we got the claps from Sia, Mike. Thanks so much for coming on the webinar today, and have a great rest of your your night. Thanks a lot. Take care, everyone.